I am excited to be here. So there's a new economic paradigm that's happening that's changing the way we build businesses, the way we work, and ultimately the way we shape economies. Um, I first figured it out or started learning about it when I was doing Zipcar. There are three reasons why I think we were successful. The first is that we leveraged excess capacity. If you think about the way you could consume cars before Zipcar, you had two choices. One, you would buy a car, the entire car, it would cost you about $9,000 a year on average, yet it would sit idle 95% of the time. So you were forced to buy more than you wanted. The second way you could consume cars was car rental. And again, you had to buy it in these 24-hour bundles. Whether you wanted it for two hours or 26 hours, you could only get it in these bites. So because both ways that you could buy cars before made you buy more, I knew that if I could let you just pay for what you used, we were going to win on that because we were ripping out the excess capacity and it changed the economics of the situation. The second thing we did is we built a platform for participation. And if you think about, we had to, if you're going to rent a car just for an hour, it has to be a really fast, simple, easy transaction. We had to take something that was complex and make it really, really simple and empower the individual to do what is done by the person behind the counter, this mysterious person. And the last thing we did is that we thought of our customers always as members and as our collaborators. We had them do things that car rental companies used to do before. We, you know, they would walk around the car to see if it had damage. They would use our fuel card to fill it up when it went, goes to a quarter tank. And really, we trusted them. In the old model, there's the counter, and it's very adversarial. And the car rental company is convinced that you're going to ruin the car, and you're going to do bad things with it. And you, as a customer, on the opposite side of the counter, thinking, hey, wait a minute. You quoted me one price. You're trying to upsell me. You're adding all this stuff. So it's very adversarial. And Zipcar, we took away that counter. We said, you know what? We're all in this together. And you're going to help, you're going to help us. You're going to be part of the team. And I love this photo here of um, so I, as I say, we thought of people as co-creators, and just to show this camaraderie we had between us, these are people leaving the hospital with their firstborn children, and they're saying, hey, wait a minute, let's stop and take a photo and mail it to Zipcar. We were really all in this together. Um, so this idea of us as co-creators, here's Moses coming out of the mountain. You know, is there space in the bottom for comments? So we really believe that we are co-creators today. We found a Zipcar in 2000, but today this kind of a common concept. And if you think of this word consumer, when you say that, doesn't it sound kind of 1950s? Like consumer? Like who's that? So this excess capacity plus people plus platforms is this structure that I'm calling Peers Inc. And it's really inventing this new collaborative economy and reinventing capitalism. This, sh this shape is one that you actually is very common. All of these companies that we've talked about for the last years have this shape. And they are, in fact, leveraging this excess capacity. And we are a key part of what's going on. Without us involved, these companies are nothing. And so the question is, why is this happening? The internet has happened and has reduced the cost of transactions. So working with lots of little parts is no longer expensive. So why did we invent companies? We invented them to do things that we as individuals couldn't do. And what would that be? You know, large investments. If it's going to cost millions of dollars. Don't ask Robin to do it. If it's going to take lots of kinds of intelligence, don't ask me. I'm good at two things. But if it's going to take 10 types of smarts, I don't have it. If it's going to require standards and consistency, I'm a puny little self. I can't force you all to wear red dresses in this audience, although see some of you have. You know, it needs a big effort to make people do these standards. And it's kind of all bound up in a brand promise, and these are often global. On the flip side, individuals do things that big entities hate doing. They have done them, but they find them expensive and annoying. And that would be localization customization and specialization. We as individuals are really good at that because we are unique and we are grounded and that's what we do really well. If you put these two things together, it turns out that they're incredibly complementary. Our skill sets and our benefits are really complementary. And because the internet exists, this new collaboration is possible and seamless. And this is what I'm calling Peers Inc. The Inc, the big, and the big entity side, builds a platform for participation. And we, the individuals, provide this incredible diversity of offering. 
And to make this kind of simpler, I think of it as a kind of yin-yang. It's a very symbiotic and collaborative relationship. Each side has to leave enough on the table for the other guys to participate. If you're too greedy, the other side won't work with you. And it's all swimming in this sea of excess capacity. So I'm going to go through these things here. I love this concept of excess capacity because it's really resource and cost efficient. And as an entrepreneur, it's where I want to go because it transforms the economics of the situation. Economic excess capacity, I define as something that already exists, it's already been paid for, but there's more value there. And there's, once you find it, there's three ways to tap into it and leverage it. The first is to slice it, and that's what Zipcar did. It took this big, solid thing and cut it up into little pieces. The second thing is that you can aggregate it. If you think about Airbnb, it's aggregated all of these millions of little, of little parts. Um, the third thing that you can do is you can open it. And this is the one that's most exciting because it's extracting brand new value. It's not using the asset more efficiently, but in a brand new way. So if we um, think about the open data movement, I see, I see this what it is. And um, McKinsey has this report that 40 Countries have released, opened up their data sets, something that the, that the government collected for its own use and already paid for and already made available. And it opened up one million data sets and said, with open APIs, and said, hey guys, here's these one million things that we know that you don't know. What do you want to do with it? And McKinsey is saying, you know what? There's a trillion dollars worth of value there. That innovators will come forward and companies will be built on the back of this. If we go to this Inc. side, why do I, who build the platform for participation? They build platform this. You know, they organize all these small parts, they make complex things really simple, and they give the power of the corporation or the power of the government down to these smaller entities. And because it's a platform, you can have these economies of scale and very, very high growth. Um, examples would be Etsy, which is a marketplace. For, for people who make stuff, and you can see this growth curve is very, um, this is what they normally look like in these platforms. It takes a long time to get the platform right. It's a lot of work, but then once it happens, it scales very fast. As you can see in 2013, they grew by 50%, and in 2014, um, by another 40%. Um, here's another company I love called BlaBlaCar, which is real ride sharing. It's in Europe. As in, I'm going from Paris to Brussels in my own car. I have three empty seats. Let me fill them. So BlaBlaCar today is transporting four million people every month, which is the same as 10,000 high-speed trains or 10,000 747s. They did not buy a track, they did not buy a rail car, they did not buy a plane, all on excess capacity. And you can see they have the, their tail, they actually started in 2006, but you can see it takes a while to ramp up and then they really move fast. Then if we look at the peers, what do peers offer? They offer diversity, it's this incredible gift that they give us. And that diversity is where the innovation and creativity comes from and resilience and redundancy. And my example there would be to think about smartphone and apps. The apps are the peers. The apps are the things that are doing all this amazing creative things with this smartphone that is the platform that has offered this consistency. So I, as an app developer, didn't have to be clever in embedded systems or you know, manufacturing things in the millions. I just had to have my life experience and what I knew I thought was really cool and make these apps on top. And the pace of this innovation since smartphones came into existence around 2009, we've had over two million apps created since then. Some of those are duplicates, but just imagine the pace of innovation and creativity that has been unleashed because of this Peers Inc. collaboration. Why do I love this Peers Inc. phenomena? And why is it very important to me? Is because it delivers these three miracles and what I think is very miraculous attributes. And before I give you those miracles, I want to depress you so that you feel the joy of the miracles. <laughs> so, be ready. What's the most depressing thing I know? Um, climate change. This is a report put out by the World Bank, and it's saying that by 2100, if every country does every single thing they promise to do, we'll be plus four degrees climate centigrade, which is seven degrees Fahrenheit, global average warming by 2100. If you're like me, what does plus seven degrees Fahrenheit mean? Like, what does that feel like? So I went and did some research, 
And the last time it was minus seven degrees climate change was the last ice age. And where we're sitting right here was under several kilometers of ice. And where I sleep in my bed at night in Cambridge, Massachusetts was under a mile of ice. So if you want to know what it feels like to move seven degrees, it's me sleeping in our beds right now under a mile of ice. But that took 20,000 years. We're going forward that amount in 85. So just get in your mind the, the enormity of this thing that we're doing. More depression. That's if everyone does everything. Over land, over land is projected, projected to be plus 11 degrees Fahrenheit over North America. Humans didn't exist in those temperatures. That's if we, every country does everything they promise to do. If they do business as usual, we'll be seeing that by 2060s, which means by 2040s, it's going to be hell. So when we talk about doing things for our grandchildren and our children, I want to ask you, do you intend to live another 15 years? If yes, let's get on with it. We have to address this issue right, right now. So my friend Benny Banerjee, he says, you can't solve exponential problems with linear solutions, and that's what we've been doing. And so I say, you know what? Try Peers, Inc. Now for the miracles. Because we are leveraging excess capacity, we can defy the laws of physics. So imagine that in 2000, instead of saying, I want to invent Zipcar, I said, I want to invent the largest hotel chain in the world, and I'm going to do it in four years. Everyone would have said, Robin, you're crazy. And I'd say, you know what? I'm going to build 650,000 rooms in four years, no problem. Every one of us would have said, that's impossible. This is what business as usual asset building would look like, the number of years. Here's what Airbnb did. In their fourth year, they had as many, they, they exceeded it already. This is what we can do because we're leveraging excess capacity. I personally am totally uninterested in some new blue-green algae, brand new cities, high-speed rail. Because if we start that today, in 30 years, we'll see the CO2 reductions. We need to do things right here, right now, with the stuff we've got right this minute. Miracle number two. Because we're building up platforms for participation, we can tap exponential learning. Learning is all about the number of iterations you can get. My example here would be, how do we learn language? The unit of measurement for language learning is a semester of college, which is 130 hours. It used to be the old fancy standard was the Rosetta Stone, because it would only take you 54 hours. And you say, whoa, I'm going to spend $1,000 on the Rosetta Stone, because it's only 54 hours. Um, my new friend, CEO of Duolingo, which is a free online language learning, he can do this A-B testing for every screen and every question, and he can and he can say, is it better to teach someone this way or this way? And in 24 hours, he'll have 150,000 people make that, try that. So he can know categorically which is the better way to learn, and he has it down to 34 hours that you can do this in. Unbelievable. And how fast has he grown? That company is just three years old now. 90 million people are using Duolingo to learn a language. Miracle number three. Because we are working with a diversity of peers, the right person will appear. And I don't mean Superman, Superman, whatever. He can fly and he's strong. But everyone in this room right now with their smartphone is way more powerful. My example here would be within six months of Obama's announcement to reestablish relationships with Cuba, Airbnb had 2,000 locations available. You can't do this the old way. You can't do this the old way. So Pearsink is fundamentally a collaboration, and you can't forget that. That all of these things happen only because we have the platform and the people doing their parts. It is this collaboration. The two things will not come together if we don't get it happening. You know, so for, to tap exponential learning, we have to have the numerous crazy ways people do things and the platform to analyze those ways and say, wow, here's best practices, here are worst practices. You have to have them working together. So I've been talking so far about what is, how it's great from the ink side, why it's great for and for society from this big angle. But what about us as individuals? What's it like to work this way? And you know what your mom says. Your mom says, get a full-time job with benefits. My mom said that. We all say that. And I think well, that's what we were told, and that's what we believe, because we've had 100 years of industrialization where we've put everything into that kind of pile. But um, I'm a knitter. And when I think about this, I think, you know what, I have a different perspective. Strength comes from many 
from many plies. And what's crazy, if we think if I were a country or if I was a company, we would say, whoa, do not have one source of revenue. You want to have many, many sources of income because that's where you get resilience. But we're saying to the single smallest economic unit, an individual, wait, you, you're only supposed to have one job. What a crazy thought. In the Peers Inc. world, we're going to have many jobs simultaneously. And we're going to have this incredible flexibility, which people love. I'm going to choose my own hours, and I'm going to work on my own time, and I'm going to have this economic agency. I want to earn this amount of money. I'm going to earn this amount of money. I want resilience, and I'm going to get to do passion jobs and money jobs. So we can't be afraid of this, and it's going to be happening. Everything that can become a platform is going to become a platform, as I've talked about. It's, it's too intriguing. But we have to make our social safety nets and workplace rules independent of full-time employment for this to be a fabulous future rather than a terrifying future. And we also have to share the productivity gains of this incredibly productive revolution that we're undergoing. Um, this is just an, a, a chart that I just want to show what's been happening. People want to blame the sharing economy for what's going to happen, and I want to say don't blame the sharing economy. This has been happening. So from 1970 till today, we've been having productivity gains which we have not been sharing out. Um, and more phenomenal is um, who gets the benefits of economic expansion. This is a, a study I love. Um, 1949 to 1953, the top 10% that was World War II expansion, post-World War II expansion, the top 10% of Americans got 20% of those economic gains. Fine, that seems kind of, that's, that feels okay. In 2009 to 2012, the top 10% took 116% of the gains. The bottom 90% slid back 16%. This is the recovery after 2008 recession. But just to make you even more horrified, the top 1% took 95% of those economic gains. So we really have to think about where we're going in this future about protecting individuals, sharing the productivity gains. But I want to leave you on an up note. I fundamentally believe with, uh, we are definitively moving from what I think of as the old industrial capitalism. And industrial capitalism, I would say, I define as the greatest value was extracted when you created scarcity by having patents and copyrights and trademarks and certifications and you were in the company and there was a big hard line and outside that company you had to pay a lot of money to get that insider knowledge. The internet exists, which means we have a whole new playing field. And we're building this thing that I think of as the collaborative economy. I'm going to share with you four principles why I believe this is so. And you can argue with me later. We don't have time for Q&A. You can, you can tell me. But this is, so let's see what you think. Shared networked assets always deliver more value than closed proprietary ones. And they do it in the two ways. One is that asset is used more efficiently, or brand new value is found on that asset. This is with Zipcar, and this would be Wikipedia and open data. The second, if we think about it from an individual perspective, from, an indiv from minds, people perspective, there's a ton of smart people in this room. And we know there are more smarter people out, there are more smart people outside than inside. It's just the facts. And now that we can find them and connect them because the internet exists, if you are working in a company or in a room or in a country, there are more smart people outside the room, outside that. So more networked minds are always smarter than fewer people inside. If we think about it from a, a societal perspective, the benefits and opportunities of shared open assets are always larger than the problems associated with shared open assets. So we can think about, you know, when I started Zipcar, everyone said, oh, everyone's going to ruin the car, it's going to be terrible, you can't trust them. And you know what? A very small percentage of people are jerks, and we can call them out, and we can penalize them, and we can get them out of the system. But we have 13, a million people sharing 13,000 cars. With Wikipedia, are there some bad facts, and is there graffiti on the pages? Sure. We identify that, but we have 4.8 million articles in English language, the world's encyclopedia. So the benefits and opportunities outweigh the problems. 
And then lastly, as my own self-interested self, I don't care about anyone else. When I participate in one of these, I always get more than what I get. I always get more than what I give. I edit three lines in Wikipedia, and I get the world's encyclopedia. So when I think about this, this future, that we're in these incredibly dynamic times, this is, Pierce Inc. is the structure for our dynamic times, because this is how, this is the cheapest, fastest way to experiment, iterate, adapt, and evolve, and we need to do that at an incredible pace. So we really need this new collaboration. Um, I think these ideas are so important that we really have to work on how we move forward into this new century. Thank you.